Hello everyone, this is Al Fadi, and I'd like to welcome you to our channel, Sierra International. If you are tuning in, uh, you're in for a treat indeed. Um, we are going to launch a brand new uh, apologetic series that deals with the so-called uh, Quran, uh, I mean, scientific miracles of the Quran, I should say, a topic that many of you, of course, if you're engaged with Muslims in terms of evangelizing them, you hear about it over and over and over again. All of, it, all of a sudden, the Quran becomes a scientific book, and the argument is, look at what the Quran says, and look why this is powerful. And from their perspective, I mean, and, and it's a fair assumption, of course, uh, look, the Quran 14 centuries ago, uh, given to us by a man who is illiterate, uh, knew something that science today have discovered. Now, if you really have no clue what this uh, miracle is all about and you don't know even how to refute it, or even don't go to the right science uh, scientific uh, sources to try to prove that uh, there isn't anything in here that worth even wasting our energy on, you might fall for this. I've met people, by the way, who were taken by it, people who began to doubt their faith, people who converted to Islam as a result of this. So this topic is extremely important. And obviously, whenever I deal with apologetic series like this, I always bring the best. And no one is better to deal with this other than my dear brother, Dr. Jay Smith. And if you know, recently he also did a, an online debate with Nadir Ahmed on the topic, and that prompted us, and I'm thankful for his uh, quick thinking, to uh, think about developing and designing such a series because it seemed like there is shortage out there in terms of addressing this professionally. And that's what we want to give you. It's going to be a brand new series dealing with the scientific miracles of the Quran. We're going to expose those, debunk them, and even venture into showing you some scientific errors that are found in the Quran itself. With that says... Welcome back, my brother. Thanks for having me. Good to be with you again. al Fadi. it's always great to be with you. You know, you. We, you have this, uh, we have this natural uh, ability to just go back and forth. The two of us, I think, really work good as a team, not only because of the fact that I love the material that you choose, but also I can then uh, throw all the Arabic stuff on you and say, listen, no one's going to trust my Arabic. I only had two years of it. I desecrate it when I try to speak it and try to pronounce it with my American accent. But when you speak it and when you use it, when you look at the Arabic that's in the text, not only is it your mother tongue, not only did you grow up with it, you have the accent that really goes along with it. And there's no one else out there that can really do it as well as you can. Now, I'm going to correct you on one thing. You said that I'm an expert in this field. No, I'm not. I have never done this material before in my life. We have never, that debate I did three weeks ago was right. the first debate I've ever done on that. But then the, here's the problem. No one has done a debate on this material. Actually, what I meant by it, no one is expert in an experience, you say, in defending the faith other than you. You're bold, you're out there. And what I love about you is you jump on any opportunity that you see that, you know what, there's a shortage of it. No one has done it. Let's go for it. Well, I there we we have a fellow in England. His name is uh, John McClatchy. He's just sat for his doctorate in science. In fact, he just fit. He just actually passed his uh, his doctorate in science. So he is, will soon be get his doctorate. He'll be Doctor John McClatchy in science. And for three years, I have been asking John to do this debate, asking John to write up on these areas because he, as a scientist, would be the best equipped to do so. That's we right. could get people like Dr. John Lennox, but he's not going to waste his time on the Quran. John McClatchy would be perfect. And I've said, and if John, if you're listening to me right now, please come on board. We need people like you with your uh, your caliber and your abilities to actually unpack this. But we're, nonetheless, three weeks ago, I was asked by ABN to do that debate with Nadir Ahmed. I've never met him. He's uh, he's really a, a, insom, a winsome fellow from Florida. But it was fascinating to me when I, because I was asked about three days before the debate to do it. I said, yeah, let me go ahead and do it. I immediately got a call from John McClellan. I said, don't do this debate. And I couldn't figure out why. John, what are you saying not to do this debate? He said, this guy is a cad. This guy is absolutely a, a slime ball is the word he used. Don't ever have anything to do with Nadir Ahmed because this guy will spend the whole time not defending anything. He'll just always attack the Bible. Right. And if you do have a chance, go up on Fander Film. We have it up there. Also, Trinity ABN has it on their channel. Right, right. Take a look and see what almost happened almost immediately. Because the title of the debate is, 
the scientific proofs in the Quran. That was the time. We're going to look at the scientific proofs in the Quran. Correct. Nothing about the Bible there because we have to kind of scratch your head and think about, do we ever have any, any debates on the scientific proofs of the Bible? Is that even a thing that you would debate? Uh, I try to think and I look, listen, I've been, to, I've been involved in about six or seven different seminaries. I have had uh, three, uh, two master's degree and a, and a doctorate from seminaries. I have never in any of those seminaries ever seen a course on scientific proofs of the Bible for one very good reason. We don't go to the Bible to find scientific proofs. The Bible is never, we don't need to go to the Bible to find scientific proofs. The Bible is never, never claims to be a scientific textbook. Right. Therefore, why would we even bring this up? That's why no one thinks this as an important endeavor. And that's the thing that I, I am always baffled by our Muslim friends. They come up with the most uh, outrageous claims about the Quran which makes it so easy to poke holes the minute you raise your standard to become dogmatic about things. Like, for instance, the Quran is a complete book. It, it's unchanged, you know, it's uh, perfectly preserved. I mean, all of a sudden, you know, one error, one mistake, that's it. You destroyed your book, and now it's a scientific book. So why then, Al-Fadi, are they making these claims? What do you think is going on here? Well, of course, I mean, you have to uh, somehow desperately present your book to be a better book than anything around it. You have to present your man to be uh, the man of the hour, the one that who knows everything. And therefore, if I can prove to you that the Quran has science in it, that has been proven by scientists, scientists today, then that tells me that Muhammad, who is an illiterate person 14 centuries ago, was given revelations from a divine. So you're admitting something in just that statement. And this is what I think is going on here. The fact that the Muslims have to look at the Quran and have to find scientific proofs in this book suggests to me that they have no other recourse but to do that That's right. because they have already known and they already are, we're being very clear about that, that you cannot prove this book is even from Muhammad. You cannot even prove it's from God or say Uthman. We've already pretty well destroyed that with our historical critique and looking at the corrections in the, in the Quran. So when you don't have any authority for this book, and remember everything that Muslims are dependent on is one book and one man, the book and the man, the book and the man. That's right. You've heard me say this many, many times. That's my favorite phrase. One book and one man. Everything is dependent on this book. This is the authority. This is the foundation. This is where they get their credibility. Uh, anything, any Muslim around the world, 1.8 billion Muslims is absolutely dependent on this book. And if you cannot find any credibility historically for this book, if you cannot even point to any manuscripts from this book that come from the 7th century that are complete and unchanged, right then you've got to go elsewhere. You've got to find some type of credibility. You've got to find something that can say that this is God's holy word because that's what they claim. They, this is their primary revelation. This is not our primary revelation. Our primary revelation is Jesus Christ himself, the word of God. Amen. This is nothing more than, you might say, the traditions about Jesus. This is the hadith of Jesus, the sayings of Jesus in the gospel accounts. This is the, uh, the sirah of Jesus, which would be the biography of Jesus in the gospel That's accounts, right. the four gospels. Right. This is the tafsir of what Jesus said and did in Paul's letters. There is the tafsir of Jesus, and this would be the tahrik of Jesus, would be the histories in the book of Acts. So in some ways, these are like the sunnah of the prophet is to Muslims. It would be the sunnah of Jesus for us. But it all points to one man. And he's our primary revelation. That's right. He is the word of God who took on flesh and dwelt among us in John 1. The word, the logos. So we would never, we do never make a claim that this is a book that where we could, we don't have to prove any thing scientifically to prove that this is authentic. We just need to look at who this man is, the Jesus of history, not the Jesus of faith, mm -hmm. the Jesus of history. We now can look outside of the book to find out where his authenticity, even by looking at hostile accounts like right. Thallus exactly. and Tacitus, exactly. Josephus, Roman, Jewish, Greek historians who wrote about him, talked about him, gave, named him. So there is no, no, that's why we wouldn't find this kind of, of, of research in Christianity. Islam has nothing to go on. That's right. Except for they think science. So this is a desperate attempt 
a last vestige of hanging on to something or coming up with something that they can finally say, yes, this is from God. If it is the word of God, we've got to prove it's from God. Nadia Ahmed, I went and did some research on this guy. This is what's fascinating. I went, there's, there's an awful lot out there. This guy's been out there. He's been really pouring through the YouTube. You can see him on quite a few YouTubes, but I went to his own site and I went to look at, at, at a uh, video that he did way back in 2000, I think it was a 2008 or 2009. So no, it was 2008. So we're talking about 11 years ago. Mm-hmm. 11 years ago, he put out a video on, he did uh, seven scientific proofs in the Quran. I said, well, I only have three days to get ready for this debate. Let me just watch that. And I just listed them down. One, two, three, four, five, six. And I was ready to go and, and unpack them with him. Because this is your material. You've been, wor- you've been working on this for uh, 11 years. All the way through the, that video, he kept on saying, why will no Christians debate me on this? Why are so many Christians scared to debate me on this? It was like a recurring thing. I can't find anybody to debate me on this. And I said, well, that was 11 years ago. We're now in 2019. I'm going to debate with you on you. And I'm not even a scientist. I'm not John McClatchy or who will soon be Dr. John McClatchy. I'm just Jay Smith, Dr. Jay Smith, but not in science. This is not my area. It's not your area, is it, either? That's right. And Eddie Yusuf, who came on the show, he was supposed to have been the moderator. He was so excited about it, he stopped being the moderator and actually joined in with me. In fact, he took half my time. I wish, I, I wish I'd heard that. I'd known that before the debate. But as we went through that, I just started shaking my head. I almost started laughing. This is the easiest debate in the world. Right. Why is it Christians haven't debated this? Why haven't we because taken the them on this? the phrase scientific miracles is a big phrase, you know? It's intimidating. Like you said, people think, oh, I have to be a scientist to be able to debate something like this. That's what I always thought, and I always thought well, this is rather a superfluous. But here you can, people like Dr. Yusuf or Yusuf Karadawi. You know this name, Yusuf Karadawi. Oh, yeah, of course. I mean, Al Jazeera Television. The, uh, yeah, you know, he's the spiritual, uh, basically, leader for the Muslim for Brotherhood. Muslim Brotherhood. Yeah. He lives in Qatar uh, right. there, and he has been, uh, for 20 years now, he has been one of the most influential clerics in the Muslim world. More people know him around the world than probably anybody else because of Al Jazeera Television. Uh, he actually got taught by Hassan al-Bana and Said Qutb. Uh, these are the men who actually taught him. But have you noticed what he's been doing almost every night? Do you know what he does on Al Jazeera television? you know what his number one signature piece is? Is it about the scientific Scientific America? exegesis. Right. Even he has fallen back on this. Even he has come up with what he considers to be absolute proof that this book is from God. And I have to laugh when I heard that. I said, no, even someone with his stature... Uh, with his background coming out of the Muslim Brotherhood, coming out of Egypt, even he has defaulted back to the scientific proofs. He has nothing else left. They have nothing else left. This is desperation. That's what I said. This is desperation. That's and I that's why I, when I called you up after this debate and I said, Al-Fadi, we've got to do a series just on this material. Amen. And I was so excited to hear this because I agree with you because it's always like you find just short, brief responses, but nothing really invested into that. And I'm thankful that uh, I have the privilege to be able to serve with you, uh, to offer the Christian community, the apologetic community, the polemicist out there, and even our Muslim uh, uh, friends, uh, the chance to examine this at a deeper level. Now, this is our introduction, uh, basically, to this series. Uh, What would you like to share about what topics we will be venturing into? We're going to actually be doing three series. This is just the first series. Uh, the first series, uh, we're, and we're just going to scratch the surface. We're going to really look at, at, at about 10 different scientific proofs that they claim. These are what they claim. Yusuf Karadawi, uh, you have uh, you, you uh, you have uh, Nadir Ahmed, of course, who's been, been uh, this is his signature priest, this is all he does. Right. And within five minutes of that debate, he quickly changed it and spent the whole time talking about two supposed scientific errors in the Bible, one having to do uh, uh, with the mustard seed, that it's not the largest seed in the world, I mean, uh, with, uh, not the smallest seed in the world, I'm sorry. And then he went to Deuteronomy 22 to look at what they called the, uh, the blood test or the virginity test, he called them, and how, how morally in- reprehensible this is. How can you have a test without even thinking through? Most of the Muslim world uses this very test to, to test the virginity of women. 
And that, that never seemed to ring a bell for him. Now, so this first series, what we're going to do now, going through this first series, is going through those, what they claim are scientific proofs. We're going to come back and do a second series on looking at the scientific errors. Right. Some of that we're actually going to introduce in this first series. But we're going to do a whole nother series just on the scientific errors. And then we're going to do a th third series in time, and that is looking at the claims by Muslims of the scientific errors in the Bible. Correct. Okay, so we'll start with the scientific proofs, and that's what we're going to do now through this series here, series number one. Later on, we're going to do a one on looking at scientific errors and how, what does this say about the Quran with these errors that they're woven all the way through that Muslims haven't bothered to look at. And then thirdly, because of the fact that Muslims find this so important, we also are going to look at then what they, what they claim are scientific errors. And we're going to do a comparison, end off at the very end when we finish these three series of doing a comparison just from the scientific standpoint. And hopefully by that time, we'll have John McClatchy on board to help us out. That will be great. And of course, the one we start with the scientific proof, meaning debunking uh, the claim that the Quran is a scientific book with a, sci with a list of scientific miracles. By the way, the list keeps growing. You know, I, I always look and uh, I mean, I, I love their heart. I love the fact that they give it a deep, deep thought and they keep adding to that list. The problem is if you debunk one of them, they're all done. I mean, that's my theory. You don't have really to wait and take them one by one. If you're claiming it's a scientific book, it has miracles, one of them being debunked, meaning all of them are Because it, it destroys the paradigm. If exactly. you start from the premise yeah. that these are proofs that of God's, of God's uh, uh, eternality, of God's hand on this book, uh, how could a man who is illiterate named Muhammad uh, have known these proofs, these scientific proofs that have only now been discovered since we have things like telescopes and we have things like microscopes right. uh, and we now know about tectonic plates. Uh, that, that's only been discovered in the 20th century, in the 21st century. How could a man in the 7th century have known something like that? Absolutely. So if that's the claim you're making, then if you make one, one a proof that uh, there is an error, then you're eradicating this whole notion that it comes from God because God does not do error. Amen. So if Amen. you're going to claim this is from God and therefore the proofs are there and these proofs are going to prove back to God, to point back to God, be careful what you're doing. Absolutely. And I because by the same token, if we find even one error, it also points back to your God, showing that your God is an error. My God is not an error. That's why we don't even need to make this claim. We know that when a writer writes about something, he's writing about what he knows in that time period. Case in point, the mustard seed. How many times did we tell Nadir, that the mustard seed is an idiomatic expression for that time. It is a metaphor, and it's hyperbole. It's taught. It doesn't. They didn't want to go to the tulip, uh, which is a, a smaller seed, because there were no tulips. They are in Netherlands, but they're not in Palestine. Tulips don't grow in Palestine. But more than that, why would you use tulips, even if you did live in a place like Netherlands where there are many tulips? Why would you use them when you're talking about the kingdom of God? The kingdom of God goes from the, the smallest to the largest. You want to use the smallest seed that goes to the largest thing, which that's is the right. mustard seed. Absolutely. And, and you know, that's the beauty about our God. He uses language that people can relate to and understand. Yeah. I mean, no one in there uh, told Jesus, hey, you're lying. That's not the, the smallest seed. I mean, uh, we, we don't hear any things. I mean, the, the Bible reports objections towards him many times. You know, if people really thought that he was exaggerating something or he was false, they would have been reported. Others would have wrote about it. I mean, like you mentioned, historians and everything else. And, and you know, uh, to, to me, brother, it seems to me that our Muslim friends are the ones who are destroying the book and the man when they make <laughs> these kind of claims. Making our job very easy, actually. It is really easy. If, if we can come up with what we're going to come up now in these episodes in just three weeks, then please, please don't say that this is a book from God. But I think that's enough as an introduction. We now are going to get into it. We're now going to start unpacking it. Let's go ahead and do that next. And that's basically where we're going to end our introduction. And in the next episode, we'll begin going through these supposed scientific proofs of the Quran, and our job is to debunk each one of them for you. Until we meet again, have a blessed day. Thanks for watching. Make sure to like and subscribe. Also hit the bell so that you don't miss future videos. And please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com forward slash International. 
and together we can introduce Muslims to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Thank you.